So this is our data and industry session on finance. Um, Amanda and I have had a couple of these sessions so far, and we're really trying to follow um, like the template for each of them. Um, quickly, Ashley, before you go, if anyone um, is not muted, if you could please mute yourself, we're just hearing a little bit of an echo. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, so each each of these sessions is going to follow um, intro history, kind of who's who um, adoption of what the different. Um, either current methods, or maybe what adoption might look like for some of the data that we'll be sharing. Um, what's next for maybe innovations in the different industries that we're looking at and then we'll round out our session with um, some discussion on the given topic. So for just overarching um, for finance, I know it's a like huge industry. There's a real breath. I think, Robert, do you mind muting? I think it might be feedback from your end. Can you, can you say that again, please? Oh, I think I'm just going to mute you real quick, if that's okay. I, I'm getting feedback. I think it might be from, but not 100%. Um, for the finance industry, I know there's a lot of different um, kind of sex that that could come into, and we'll go into the different kind of branches of finance um, in the, the next section. But overall, I think the connection with data itself, um, especially more recently, looking at FinTech as just financial technology and seeing some of the different um, innovations there. And one of the projections that I just wanted to kind of toss on here from is kind of from one of those standard like, hey, here's some like market trends or whatever to kind of um, get people excited about different industries um, was kind of a, a figure for just growth in finance applications. I feel like that's something that we've seen um, a lot kind of like in recent years, um, with different shifts of things getting more um, digitized in the finance industry itself. Um, and then also for different um, industries within finance, if we're looking at things like marketing, um, investing and auditing, there's a lot of different ways that data can be incorporated um, into that. And also for just overall market research, um, I know it's not a marketing session, but just kind of the interaction between um, translating different company goals and what people are looking for for their products and how um, different research can kind of fund back into how people are pretty much making money um, with their companies. Um, so for history, I just wanted to grab a couple different things that kind of um, came to mind, at least for, for me, for trying to figure out, okay, what's the connection between data, maybe some digitization in finance and some kind of major, um, history points coming in. Um, one of the things that I thought of to begin with was kind of the early history, um, involving credit cards. Um, so I've got a couple of things up here, um, in the 1960s. That was when um, certain cards, such as like American Express and an early form of what would later become um, part of the MasterCard conglomerate, um, Bank AmeriCard, um, came out with types of charged cards that were really becoming um, more like widespread and adopted. There were some smaller um, instances of types of credit cards that had come into existence in the United States and people had been using them for different things, but those were kind of two of the big um, ones that came around around the late 1960s. Um, and then another note here in 1969, that was when um, IBM engineer Force Perry invented the magnetic strip for uh, credit cards. And that was, wasn't the same like year that it, you know, went mass on the market or anything like that, but that was kind of the inception of the transfer of different data from something like that to kind of make it more, um, once again, having something like credit cards being like widespread, having a way to 
collect the transaction information and gather that data for um, the different companies and different people that were in charge of um, having cards like that. Um, and then from the, in the 1970s, that was kind of the time um, when algorithmic trading kind of came on the scene um, for the New York Stock Exchange. And that was when a designated order turnover system was introduced. So even though there was trading um, before that, that was kind of the like precipice of having um, different trades go in and have them be put in such a way that people could have their algorithms kind of working for them for um, different trades that they wanted to make. Um, another point on here um, in the 1990s, um, electronic communication networks, ECNs, um, began to allow stock and currency to be traded outside of normal exchanges. So I think for that, just to note, um, even though for certain things, um, with the example of like the New York Stock Exchange itself, there's, you know, these huge um, different exchanges that, you know, people think of, of like, oh, these are kind of the um, like baselines for where all this trading is happening. Um, this kind of expands to different markets and also um, for different currencies, kind of opening up um, some of that like economic growth there as well. Um, and then another point that I had on here, it's not related, but I do have them on the same line because it did happen to be the same year. Um, in 2009, Bitcoin was launched. Um, there was cryptocurrency before that time, but that real kind of introduction of having, let me see, notes I've got here, um, for just the blockchain and having these open ledgers in this, you know, different system of um, currency that was outside of what was otherwise um, regulated through through banks, having something like that, where it's technological growth in the finance industry, but it's kind of separate doing its own thing and having a distributed computing system was, you know, really, it, at least at this point in time, I know there's a ton of like super popular and cool cryptocurrencies, but I feel like Bitcoin was like the big one, um, at least to have kind of rapid growth and then to see that incorporation um, with, with the blockchain. Um, and then another point I want to put on here, um, just as we talk about kind of digitization with different, um, like the different manifestations of finance, if it's banking, um, transactions, all these different things, um, for, for Square Inc, that started in um, 2009 as well. Um, and that's transformed, I think it's called like Block Inc at this point, but having um, something like that come out, um, the major company goal kind of to begin with for Square was to help businesses that um, might not otherwise be able to have transactions with customers because of the you know different fees and things like that of working with larger banks. Like what are the barriers for businesses either digitizing, having some kind of electronic um, financing for their companies. Um, so that kind of broke down uh, a barrier of kind of helping different, you know, small businesses uh, expand their their economic reach. So that's, I don't know, at least, at least to me, I think that's kind of a cool thing. Um, and then I just have a quote here that was from, uh, I think it was just a Har Harvard um, business review paper on just finance and analytics, um, just talking about the different um, capabilities of organizations that, you know, looking into their data, trying to figure out, like, how many endless opportunities there are um, in tech with that. Okay, so for the who's who, um, instead of having, like, specific people on this one, I kind of wanted to lay out some of the different forms that finance um, takes, and then also kind of the um, interaction that that has with data itself um, or technology. So for, I know there's like the big six, the big four, I don't know what it is at this point for accounting, but um, I wanted to list out a couple of like the more popular ones. Um, so firms like Deloitte, um, Pricewaterhouse, Ernst & Young, KPMG, um, there's different accounting firms that are helping different companies function and helping with things like risk auditing and things like that, where 
they are going into different companies and kind of helping out and seeing what different um, needs people have. But there's that backbone of most of it being kind of financially um, motivated. Robert, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, anecdotally, yeah. I've worked with people from every accounting firm on here and none of you the have, other okay. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know exactly why that is. No, that's I that's awesome. I I've only um like known people at Ernst and Young, so I'm not I'm not like that well, but I know that like finance and accounting at least from what I've seen from different like speaker sessions for people in like software kind of I don't know, kind yeah. of go hand in hand. So, I thought it was like might as might as well throw them up there because they've definitely uh, got their hands in the pot. <laughs> I wonder if anyone here has worked with anyone in anything here that's not an accounting firm because we seem to have accounting. Uh, <laughs> it's... Got that representation covered, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then, um, the other ones that I've got up here, I wanted to put um, just different investment companies, um, different kind of like either if it's at like a company level or kind of at a personal finance level, um, Berkshire Hathaway, Vanguard, Fidelity, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. Um, I know we probably all have at least some kind of knowledge of, you know, getting different ads or things like that for, um, you know, investing different places. But I think for just the grand scheme of all the different data that might go into um, investment companies trying to figure out, okay, like, is this, um, someone that might be targeted for, for different, um, different investments and things like that. Um, also for, for overall, just business software, um, in finance, um, I wanted to put down into it and NetSuite just for overall accounting. And then also you know a lot of times finance and taxes go hand in hand and just sort of the different, um, kind of breakdowns within. Um, business software companies, especially catering to different um, skills of business. Um, and then also just that like personal um, level of finance as well. Um, another thing that I want to bring up just in general um, is terminals. I wasn't super familiar with this um, before doing a little bit more research on it. Um, terminals are a way of getting like different financial data that might be behind um, different research that might not necessarily be as easy to grab as um, just overall open source data. Um, and Bloomberg and Refinitiv are two of like the big names and terminals for kind of catering to, um, hey, how can we get different like market research or different data sets that might be helping um, companies either like meet their goals or help them kind of like pivot and find different ways um, to make money or change what they're doing. Um, and then just for regulatory um, agencies, I know at least for like the United States government, we have a couple different um, areas like within that, but for um, like the FDIC, at least the relation to banking, um, trying to think of ways that there are resources for regulators um, in that aspect, but they also have, um, at least from their, like, based on like their website, they have some cool resources for like data professionals or people working in finance at different companies to try and see like how, um, you know, what they're doing is meeting the different um, regulations that we have. And then um, just, oh, sorry, minute. Just to quickly touch back on terminals, I want to I wanna really put an emphasis on this. So there are a lot of different terminals available now, but um, the Bloomberg terminal really is what drove that really intensive data usage in the financial industry. It's with stock exchange and with um, investors attempting to get the extra penny above anyone else. Uh, data has always been extremely important, but one of those pivotal moments was the release of the Bloomberg terminal. And I don't, I don't know if any of you guys watched the the newsroom on uh, HBO, but there is this amazing scene where the um, economist on the reporting team, she's at her Bloomberg terminal, and she 
uses the variety of charts that she has available to her in the real time data that's coming directly um, streaming from uh, from the uh, the floors of trading rooms. Um, th that that is a scene that speaks to just how important the data that is being used in the finance sector is. Yeah, I think, I mean, I want to say I might touch on this maybe on the next one, but yeah, I think for that, especially it being like this overarching, it's like, you don't have to go to 50 different places. It's like, that's where you're going for your information. Like with that connection to whoever's like, using that as like a paying like vendor, so. Exactly, yeah. Um, I know this isn't like exhaustive, but I wanted to list um, a couple of the different roles that might involve um, just data and finance um, at different companies. So just overarching like chief financial officer would be one of them, just that backbone of like, how is data related to all the different company functions um, and then just different analyst positions um, within a company. Um, if, if it's just coming from the data side or maybe it's coming from fraud to try and see like how fraudulent interactions are, you know, coming in and interacting with with whatever the different company is. Um, and then also just marketing um, as well as like cybersecurity and then kind of how data architecture is set up um, for data engineering. Um, so then for adoption, um, this isn't like a huge timeline of like this going, like one thing going to another, but for just the general ways that um, having kind of a strong um, data background for a company or for like an individual in finance might, might take form. Um, as Amanda was saying about the terminals, kind of having like the different like data sources, like what data source can um, some finance company have that's going to make them stand out or be different. Um, and especially with um, new emerging technologies, um, having, you know, like you could have just some here's some like stock data. That's pretty cool. But also um, people tapping into things like satellite imagery, trying to figure out like, hey, I have a company concept. And if I leverage this data that's out there anyway, maybe it's free, it could turn into a company making more money because now they have some kind of in information that maybe a competitor doesn't have. Um, but other things as well, I know there are some kind of weird trendy like cryptocurrency things of like, hey, this thing is blowing up on Twitter or maybe on Reddit or something like that, that would become something where that data of like user, like user data or sentiment data that might be coming from like a social media platform that that information's out there. It's like, it's available to be scraped and used by a company if that's what someone's choosing to do, obviously depending on, you know, different usage rights and things like that. But most of the time um, having kind of like these public um, sources of information that could get translated into something that would be beneficial um, in the finance industry. And just overall like data collection. Um, so that being kind of how data is being leveraged, um, data mining to be either gathering that different information from places that already exist and maybe making it a little bit different or trying to garner different um, things out of it that maybe other people aren't or creating um, characteristics out of data that somebody already has to help them, you know, figure out things in, in different and new markets that could, could make money. Um, predictive modeling, especially with maybe like customer, seg customer segmentation and things like that. Um, and also just general, I know everybody says like, hey, like nobody knows what the finance markets are gonna do any day, but everybody's still paying attention to a lot of graphs in it. So I think, there is something like to that um, data architecture being how uh, the data warehouses, how different things are set up it in different um, financial settings. And then just overall cybersecurity kind of playing also into that fraud um, aspect as well. I know cybersecurity analysts, fraud analysts, like any of these companies that are doing awesome things also have a strong backbone in their cybersecurity departments because you need to to 
number one, stay competitive, but also when we're talking about financial data, a lot of it is information that people either don't want shared or is personally identifiable, all of these things that require having that justified, strong security. Um, and then just overall analytics and insights, what people are um, gathering from, from the different data that they have. And then I think, so for what's next, this is another one where it's like, this could go any possible way, but um, I want to put up a couple of things that maybe um, were exciting or kind of fun in the finance and data data sphere. Um, so especially with um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and just seeing the different ways that um, innovation in that part of it is playing into how new fintech companies are coming up, like what people are using for just what are their market drivers, like what's coming out of it. Um, and then mentioned kind of on the previous slide, different um, cybersecurity adaptions. Um, so as things progress, um, obviously there's just that constant battle of like cat and mouse with that to figure out how to keep um, company data secure and also obviously consumer data as well related to that. Um, I didn't mention it on like the history slide because I know we've had um, a bunch of these, but there's kind of the famous um, security breaches for um, some of the different like credit firms to have different people kind of realize like, oh, hey, this could affect me. This isn't just um, some number on a sheet of paper. So it could be like your financial data that, that goes out. Robert, I see you've got your hand up. Oh, I think you might be muted. All right, it's the last time I do that. No, you're fine. <laughs> On the note of cybersecurity, this is public knowledge, so I don't feel bad about saying it, but there's this company involved that we're involved with that just went out of business overnight because someone clicked oh, the link. God. They got ransomware and overnight you're told, don't bother coming into work tomorrow, we're not gonna bother. All yeah, the data is yeah. locked out. No one can get their partner's data anymore. That's terrifying. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what happens is often through human intervention, unfortunately. So you can put up as many fraud blockers, cybersecurity automation as you want, often through human intervention. Someone clicks a phishing link or they uh, they get a call that is their boss's secretary who needs their information, login information over the phone right now. And the next thing you know, the entire company is locked out of your firewall and you've been completely overtaken by a malicious, uh, a malicious actor. Um, especially in the finance industry, this is rampant because of how much money those malicious actors can get out of the information that they can seize from organizations. In banking, there's the phenomenon, which I'm sure you guys might have heard of there, where you get someone defaults on a loan and then all of a sudden everyone that they owe money defaults on a loan, you've got this cascading catastrophe. And I wonder if we've had that yet with lost information or if, or if that would never happen. But you could picture one company loses another company's data and so that means they lose everyone else's data and then everything falls apart. Um, so that to a certain extent does happen. I can get into that in a second, but, uh, Ross, go ahead. Well, it seems like, and that's such a terrible story about the people being out of business overnight. It's like nightmare. Um, it seems though, and maybe I'm just not understanding the problem, but if they had secure offsite backups, couldn't they just wipe their system, re-upload their data and be good to go? It was ransomware, so I don't know what their ability to get into things was. Well, as long as as long as the ransom the ransomware can take over their system, but if yeah. they have a separate like time machine backup that's not connected to their system, can't they just well, nuke their system and re-upload it? Like what's yeah? What I so I don't know. They, <laughs> so that, they didn't for whatever reason. They seemed unable to. I don't know what their problem uh, was. They didn't have so, it in place. It's too late. Yeah, and, and even if you do have a complete remote isolated backup, um, if you've been isolated from your systems by the malicious actor, you may not be able to wipe them. So the issue is no longer 
do you have the data? It's can you take the data away from the malicious, malicious actor? Yes, that is tricky. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of the uh, spy versus spy situation where how can those uh, white hat hackers be more clever than the black hat hackers? I, I read uh, a lot of military history and some of the um, the white hat hackers have been going back to like they were they were referencing strategic like literally military writings from like the earliest 20th century and referencing tr trench warfare. And anyway, um, one of the ways I've heard they do this is they will set, set it up so that the hacker can get into the system, but it's not the real system. And they will watch what the hacker does and they kind of let them, you let the hacker come to you and you learn about them and then you counterattack and like get them, but they haven't gotten your data because it's all like fake data, but you have to set up this whole dummy system for them to attack first, which is so, pretty intense. Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of the equal but opposite attempts of malicious actors trying to get you to click a link to a website that looks like the website you're trying to sign into, but it's not, it's their like fake web page. So, um, so like they malicious attackers can create fake web pages, fake environments, and um, and they trap people like that. But white ha hackers can do the exact same thing, where they create an entirely fake environment, and um, and kind of coax malicious actors out and identify the moves they would make and kind of have the hackers help them secure their uh their organizations even better because by going through this dummy labyrinth they have shown the organization security teams exactly what those malicious actors would have done if they were in the real data sets right right it seems like you could have um if you set up a dummy environment i want this is like totally speculating here but could you ha essentially web scrape your own environment so you just have ml clicking on all the links and if anything nasty comes out of the links who cares and then if they're approved then a human clicks on them it seems like if humans are the error here let's take them out and i don't mean to hijack this whole thing because this is not a cybersecurity thing so we can talk about this later but um it's interesting no not at all i think that's a great idea and i think um yeah just with time let's get back to the finance stuff but um, I'll write that down as a potential topic for future. And if you're really interested, reach out. Um, if people want to speak about different topics and stuff, we're always open to that. So, um, so yeah, reach out if you're interested. Cool. All yours, Ash. Yeah, I think the only, just the last point that I had on here, um, not to shamelessly plug the environment, but the green finance is kind of a cool, um, interesting thing that's i think i at least as like an investment um standpoint or to try and see different um fintech companies kind of trying to interact with hey how do we merge um some of these goals of um you know like reducing emissions all these different climate change goals how that is merging with different um like startup funding and different just companies coming on the scene um, in that regard. So just kind of want to toss it on here as just like a thought point of how something that I know, like the finance industry in general might not be seen as like, oh, that's something that could leverage, but kind of the way that, um, you know, companies could come around and cater to something like that, where you're meeting um, a different goal that might not 100% be like just trying to make profit for whatever the company is. So just thought something to throw on there. Um, and then I think the next one, so then it's just the discussion um, portion. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll just go back to the normal like meeting setting. So I think the last point you made was really interesting, Ashley, and this has become a significant trend in finance over the last few years. And it's this value-based venture capitalism. So it's not necessarily all about how do you make me a profit? It's about 
how do you meet the goals that I as an individual and we as a venture capitalist organization want to drive in the world around us? So whether that's, um, you know, green finance or it's decreasing homelessness or it's um, supporting education. There are a lot of different value-based venture capitalists who are no longer simply viewing data in the sense, especially when they're identifying potential prospects. They're not just looking at their data of profit and loss. They're looking at their data of investment in the communities around them, which is a very different qualitative data that I think financial organizations have been very used to over the past 300 years. You're on mute, Robert. I was talking to myself. <laughs> I was just whispering to myself. I was whispering. I don't know what that is. Ethan said to everyone the ESG investments. I don't know what the ESG investments are. Ethan, what are the ESG investments? Uh, isn't that like the environmental, social, and governance um, investments? I mean, coming from the advising role, uh, we did a lot of these for our um, clients who are very, uh, you know, strong, um, very dedicated to, you know, saving the uh, like, you know, just investing in companies that have same morals and practice, you know, those kind of things. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think a good example of that is four or five years ago, maybe, that uh, New York State particularly did some divestments of their, both their pension program and I believe their education program. And those divestments were specifically around um, organizations that either promote or manufacture guns and organizations that promote or manufacture uh, petroleum, um, particularly in unhealthy ways. And so the state made a very specific decision that they would no longer be investing these large amounts of money that the state controls into these organizations that are harming their citizens. Because as a public entity, as the representatives of the state of New York, they saw these organizations, while profitable, were intrinsically harming their citizens. Um, and so, obviously, that's a that's a different perspective than a private organization that's interested in truly being kind to the environment or the people around them. Um, but because New York State looked at itself as a representative of the citizenry of New York State, they wanted to divest from those organizations that harm New York Staters. I worked on the pensions around that time. The people that did the bond rate analysis was it was it was the actuaries managing everyone's benefits and we had to it was Christmas, I think. It was the turn of the new year and everyone had to like you had your PTO and you could either go home for your vacation or check out the new bond rates and stay up all night and get paid overtime. Did you see any interesting trends as there was that transition from highly profitable industries that were destructive to potentially less uh, profitable industries that were more beneficial to citizenry? I was in the room, but I didn't look at the numbers. Okay. I mean, they always perform a lot worse than those companies that are, you know, profitable. So you really have to believe in that, you know, idea or um, ideology to really want to invest in that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that does become the unfortunate point. Um, I always find it interesting with um, with different startups or um, like value based organizations, not necessarily value value based finance organizations, but things like Rothy's shoes that, um, you know, it's a shoe and they do like bags and stuff now that's completely made out of plastic and they donate, I think, like a third of their profits to environmentally focused NGOs. Um, and so, like, that's a value based organization that is basing their entire business plan off of being environmentally conservative. Um, there, there's also um, 
what was that other shoe company like isn't it Tom's that yeah Tom's yeah. shoes where the the basis of their financial planning was they were going to make their product more expensive so that they could donate one of their products every time they sold one of their products and um and so there's these very interesting compromises that organizations are are taking towards their capitalistic driven business plans to also work in their values uh ross your hand is raised oh i just forgot to take it down um, <laughs> i was gonna I say did. you don't have to Sorry. raise your hand for these okay <laughs> Uh, I did have a question though for Ethan. Um, Ethan, you were saying they always the ESG stuff always performed a lot worse, which I'm not. It, it's not surprising, but did you see any sort of value based type companies that were like, was it close? Were they even competitive, or was it like way, way worse? You know what I mean? A lot of, yeah. Well, a lot of times what we would do is, and we would only you know show this to clients if they specifically ask for it. And mm. these were more so we and we would only kind of show them like a mutual fund or EF ETFs that kind of packages everything together instead of showing them individual stocks that or companies that participate in ESG or that are ESG. So um, it's hard to say, but it's always, always underperformance by 20, 30 percent of like the uh, like. S&P 500, right? So yeah. it's, 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 it's never, it's a big give and take there. That sucks. I've seen like, instead of individual stocks necessarily, ETFs that are becoming ESGs essentially. So it's like a bundle. So you're mm -hmm. performing in a more standard way, but you can still focus on those values. No, the ETFs were more of these, like, say, you know, Fidelity or these other um, fund companies that bundle a um, companies or stocks that only participate in ESG, only okay, operate, that, yes. oh, only operate in ESG. Yes, so, that's exactly yeah. what I was asking. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It, it's interesting that, I mean. Like you said, Ross, it makes sense, unfortunately, but it is interesting knowing how much lower that performance is. Ethan, let me ask you another one, just because you're you're in the. I, I, you, I don't know anything about personal finance aside from. <laughs> my personal finance, um, did you ever see anything like, okay, let's take Exxon Mobil, right? Exxon Mobil obviously is making petroleum products and probably polluting the environment and blah, blah, blah. Um, but they are extremely profitable. Did you ever see anything where they had like a special share class or something where they were saying, we invest with us in these shares and we're going to use this to build a liquid hydrogen plant or something? Like we're still Exxon, but we can do this cool stuff. No, that, that would only happen if they were, they did a, like a, what is it? Like, um, like a split, a separate, yeah, separate company that is under the umbrella of um, Exxon, but they would have to have their own stock symbol because they can't, it can't be commingled in that way. Interesting. Okay, I hadn't thought of that. Hm. So it would have to be like a, an Alphabet Google situation, right? Yeah, you would have to have a complete spinoff of a company that only specific specifically does that. And they would have to be a publicly traded company. Then right. you would why, be able to, would, yeah, would then you would be able to go into the ESG, you know, ETS or be considered an ESG uh, company. Right, right. But why, why would, why would a big non ESG company bother with that if they're already making like billions of dollars a day? Yeah. I mean, they do. I mean, you see the ad advertisement that, you know, with Exxon or Shell that they are very green and they are, you know, helping, you know, um, even with like Marlboro and, and, you know, those kind of cigarette companies that are saying, oh, we're going to help, you know, uh, you know, help people stop smoking and all those things, but they're still producing, you know, cigarettes and they're still selling these cigarettes and still considered, you know, um, 
what is it? Those like, what what's that? Um, drugs, alcohol, and cigarettes. What what is that called? Oh, uh, the ATF. Yes, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah. Anyway, interesting. Yeah. So I didn't mean to hijack. I didn't want to. Yeah. No, this is this is exactly I think what uh, what we're looking to get out of these. Um, I guess I I want to know from you guys. Um, so we put out our what's next trends, uh, but that's our opinion. So I want to hear what you guys think. What kind of trends do you see coming in the financial industry, especially around data? Your point earlier, Amanda, about batch files versus streaming, it's going to really change things. Yeah, yeah, and that's an interesting thing I've been diving into lately, um, where is there really a point in having anything be batch, even slowly changing dimensions, because we no longer have to worry about that kind of stuff you know we have automatic shutoffs of servers and warehouses we have um we have the ability to elasticize our warehouses there um that is a topic for another day because <laughs> that's a trend across the entirety of the data industry um i'll probably do a session on that after i do my speaker session because um i'll have it all written up already and that'll be easy <laughs> um but uh, but I think it's really interesting debating the pros and cons of having hybrid environments with some real time streaming for the things that are necessary versus batch filing for those slowly changing dimensions or things you only need once a day. And is it really worth doing large style batch batch processing if 30 minutes into your process, you get an error and you have to start from the beginning again? One thing that occurred to me, it was because of uh, something Ashley said in the presentation, actually, and, and thank you, Ashley, for, for spelling all that out for us. Um, Square helps, helped people that couldn't, it empowered people to make transactions they couldn't make before, right? So that's, it opens up a new market, very cool. Um, I was thinking about that as, as everyone was speaking and thinking about how finance is a, like people have been trading stocks for quite some time. It's a pretty mature industry. So where does the next revolution come from? Because like we might get 4% faster and that'll make you a billion dollars, but that's, you know, you have to have a billion dollars to get 4% faster to make a billion dollars. Like none of us here are probably going to be involved in that. Um, but then it was like, okay, who are the people that are not empowered right now to make the kind of transactions that we all make. And it's people that live in the third world, people in India. Like where is the startup that's gonna let the billion people in India, like where's the square for them? Or if there is square, is there an Indian version? Like how do you, how do you help those people be on this call and be part of our first world economy? I feel like I'm sure people are working on that. It's not like revolutionary, but there's so many people there. There's gotta be so much money. Yeah, and you're completely right on that. Like, unfortunately, it is a daily occurrence that 75% of the world's population are ignored because they're not wealthy. And for so many other reasons, because of their demographics. Um, I think that along with kind of the ESG mentality, there are startups that are working towards things. One of the things that I find really interesting that um, that we'll talk about during our data and real property session is, um, is not just the proliferation of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but blockchain in general. Um, that allows individuals to protect their wealth or their real property or their assets in a way that allow for true collection of wealth instead of um, 
instead of the idea that yeah sure you live on this land but maybe you don't have the deed for it and so you don't own it so someone can take it away from you um so like that's a very small piece of that but I, th I think there's a huge green field for organizations and individuals to identify ways in which people who have big barriers to entry can attempt to play the game because they're likely going to be better at it than we are. <laughs> The wheels are turning here. <laughs> that is what we aim for. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so it's eight o'clock. Um, I don't want to keep you guys. We do have a couple announcements. I just want to follow up from the beginning, and I thought of a few as we went through. So, um, so a couple um call for speakers are open right now. Um, the Grace Hopper celebration is currently accepting speakers until our speaker applications until the 26th. So if you're interested in speaking there, that is open. Um, DBT is also offering for their, um, can't remember what their conference is called, but, um, uh, but they are accepting speakers until the 23rd. Um, there's a bunch of other conferences out there, whether you want to speak or join. Um, it is currently conference season for the next like six months. So if there are things you want to look at, go ahead there. Um, we have a session next month um, that is going to be data in agriculture. So we'll be talking about things like um, UAVBs and the ability to track the nutrients within the soil and automated seed starting and all of the ways that data impacts the agricultural world. Uh, uh, Robert has a job posted. Is that why your hand is raised? Nope. No. Okay, you can go ahead. I wonder if you all ever get the Proquis. Proquis, I don't know how to pronounce it, speaking offers. They send those emails out all the time. And I don't know how much of a scam it is or what it is. So I've never gotten one of those. Um, I do get a lot of things that look like scams where it's like, we'll pay you a hundred bucks to be a speaker. And it's for like an executive uh, suite that's trying to get a certification and needs like a lunch and learn hour. Hmm. Um, so like some of them are good, some of, them are, some of them are bad. I would recommend that you go to Reddit and see any comments or reviews of different speaker session like styles and sites and recruiters um usually you'll get the most candid responses there yeah all right um other than that robert has a job position open it's in the chat um ashley um, I think that's everything. Oh, I was going to say the whole agriculture thing. I was like blockchain for accountable, like supply chains and agriculture, but I'm sure we'll talk about that. But I just got excited. Yes. But yeah, we'll talk about things like C, uh, C the Table, which is a seafood organization that monitors, um, you know, ocean to table fishing practices and makes them transparent and available to consumers. So we'll talk about all that kind of stuff. So, um, Thank you, everyone. Have a great night and thank you for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We should have a bye. <laughs> Robert, I'm still on. I just turned my camera off. What's up? <laughs> we should have a session on what you guys are all learning at your data boot camps. I'm so curious, Landon, what you're oh, doing. Oh, yeah. I think that would be a super good. Like a recap of the data boot camps. Potentially, yeah. I mean, most of it is uh, I've done like a statistics unit and uh tableau because i've literally never used tableau before so it's probably not very interesting it's probably super basic compared to what a lot of y'all work with i don't know Lena. sometimes I, there's i feel like there's always cool stuff to learn so i'll i'll like let amanda know i think that's a good idea robert Thanks. i think it'd be great a lot of times people talk over each other's head because they assume that the basic stuff everybody knows but a lot of times they don't know the basic stuff and they would love to have a one-on-one 101 on it fair fair all right. That sounds really cool. I'd be into that.
Bye guys again. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. See you, everyone.